welcome. I'm glad you guys are here. And uh, today we are talking about Prove It, um, exactly how modern marketers can earn trust by Melanie Diesel and Phil M. Jones. I'm not sure if I'm saying her last name correctly, but um, we'll hope for the best. So um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. I want to uh, let's go around and do introductions. I'm Paula Williams with ABCI. We help aviation companies sell more of their products and services. John Williams, I help her do that. <laughs> that was short. Very short. Right. Gene Clow, I have great circle aircraft. I specialize in uh, sale and acquisitions of corporate jets. I'm Michael Duke. I am CEO of uh, and co-founder of DBT Era. And our focus is making 100% um, sustainable flight um, affordable and quiet. We've got some cool new designs and we're excited to uh, commercialize those and get them in the hands of people like Gene and others that are, you know, working uh, to um, with the people that are operating and buying them. I've got a plane that flies over every morning. <laughs> Yeah. You won't find many sympathetic ears here, Stella. Everybody here loves planes. <laughs> it might be mine. You never can tell. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. But it, I mean, it's like 5.30 in the morning. Are you serious? Wow. I don't need an alarm clock. There goes the plane. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love your background, by the way. That's really cool for book club. Okay. Well, that, that used to be my bookshelf back in the U.S. when I lived in the U.S. Mm. I had tons of books. <laughs> cool. So, and so I'm Stella. Do... I, I'm yes. a crafty uh, content creator, copywriter, working with CI. Fabulous. Glad you're here. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to start with a um, an article that John just shared with me that is related to this. Most of this book is about content. And we just read a, an article in the New York Times. Emma Thompson was... Uh, you know, opining on the writer strike, you know, the Hollywood situation and everything else. And she says the term content is rude. It sounds like the stuffing in a sofa cushion and it sounds like it's all the same, uh, all of the same value. And I think that really leads to the concept of, uh, you know, the, the struggle that we have with a lot of new clients thinking, you know, if we tell them they need to post two or three times a week, they're thinking, you know, I'm posting for the sake of posting. But, um, and that's, the problem is content is not just content. Posting is not just posting. The problem with content is it makes people who make garbage think they're making art and people who make art think they're making garbage is what Emma Thompson said. And she, I love Emma Thompson. She is so <laughs> articulate, you know, about everything. She's uh, really good in every movie I've ever seen, but, um, and that's the problem. And this is the solution. This book is a solution, I think really, because if you think of what we're doing as evidence, uh, instead of as content, then that changes the way we think about what we're doing. You know, the the posts, the infographics, the videos, the pictures, the the articles, the everything that we do is evidence for why you should buy our product or why you should do business with us or why you should invest in our company or why you should do whatever it is we're trying to convince them of doing, right? Well, there's your content calendar for the next year. Yeah, exactly. That is absolutely true. You want to go around the room and just talk about first impressions of the book? I've shared mine already, so. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be first. Um, I actually liked your first impression because um, my, my review of the book is that I enjoyed part one. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, I understand the format of saying, here's the high level and then here's the detail. Yeah. Um, but frankly, you know, I think I may have learned more from your little introduction than I did from the book. I found the book really difficult to read. I, I mean, not like the words were difficult or anything. It was just, I was not motivated. After reading part one, I just, the, the, the part two of the book was just drudgery for me. Okay. Yeah, I just that's fair. didn't, didn't, you know, it didn't fit with what I was looking for. I thought the content in part one was really good. 
I thought some of the, um, the, the strategies for in the second part of the book were also very good, but it was just because of the layout. I mean, I think of it as you've got this matrix and, yeah. got, you know, they've got this matrix and they lay the matrix out in the first part of the book. And then they go through box by box by box over, you know, and it's like over and over and over um, with very minor changes um, through part two. And so I just found part two to be quite boring. I can see it's very useful. Yeah. Um, and, but at the same time, from a reading standpoint, I found part two quite boring. Okay. That's totally fair. I agree. <laughs> I, I actually hadn't thought about it that way, but you're right. Part one was entertaining. Uh, part two, I pretty much got down to the um, portions that once I read it, I said, that's what really applies to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the part on convenience, I tried that once, darn near went broke. <laughs> the uh, uh, the uh, proving competence uh, is the big one yeah. uh, for what I do. And uh, I'm, down, I'm now down to 97.6%. <laughs> okay. See, and I thought it was because I was on a plane while I was doing this. And so the oxygen level was dropping. So I felt really smart in the first half of the book. And I felt like dumber and dumber and dumber as I kept reading, you know, and I thought it was yeah. just, well, they must have the oxygen turned way down so that we'll sleep, you know, but anyway. I have done that. You have done that? <laughs> I have done that. Yeah, I, when I was flying 135 and I had a, picked up some forest fire managers and they had had a good time before they got on the airplane, and we were on about an hour and a half flight, and they were laughing and giggling in the back, so I just ran the pressurization up. <laughs> and they just yeah. went right out yeah. like a light. Yeah. <laughs> you, may, you may want to edit that out. section out, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> we never went above 10,000 feet in the cabin, so it didn't go above 8,000, actually. But mm -hmm. They didn't care. I turned the temperature up in the altitude, and they slept nicely. Oh, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what they were doing is turning down the oxygen, turning down the temperature. And so, you know, we're all like snuggled in blankets and just in the back. But yeah. the first half, I was just going on fire. You know, I'm reading through and I've got like my iPad on one knee and my phone on the other knee. And I'm reading it in Kindle and taking notes in my notepad and, you know, just like, you know, going back and forth and back and forth. And then the second half, Right. I just kind of started to lose uh, lose enthusiasm really rapidly between part one and part two. Yeah, that's well, called multitasking. I don't do that. <laughs> I lost the title. She wasn't doing so much to prove it. She was putting us to sleep. <laughs> well, yeah. Go ahead, John. They pretty much glossed over the trust issues and how you gain that from your audience. And I, I just sort of looked at that and said, okay, fine. I mean, how do you gain trust from somebody you don't know? Now, at the business school, this was a right up front thing they talked about in one of the classes. And uh, because I told them, I mean, I sat up in the front row of this one because I didn't want to miss anything. And, and they, uh, I told them, I said, he asked me, how do you gain trust? He asked the class. Yeah, and I said, well, that's interesting. You talk to somebody, and before you start the communication, you have to assume a level of trust. And then once you start the discussion, based on what you learn, the trust level goes up or down. And that's the same way with what it is with respect to selling products. Once you start the discussion, and once you start proving it, the trust will go up or down. Actually, I thought this book did better than most. And the reason is because, I don't know if you can see this, but at the end of every chapter, they had the gray section, mm -hmm. um, you know, exactly what to do now. Um, and most books don't do that. You know, they just assume they let you kind of extrapolate that from, uh, you know, they tell you the theory and then they don't really separate the theory from the practice. And this book, I thought they did a really nice job of 
especially in part one of here's the theory and then here's the practice. And in the boxes of exactly what to do now is you make a list and here's the list. Mm -hmm. And then you fill in the boxes in the list. And I thought it was very specific and very helpful. Yeah, Some I, of like, it. I like that as well. That yeah. was, that was putting, putting the things that were discussed into action. And even though, as I commented earlier, part two felt like we were going over each box in the matrix and saying very similar things kind of for each box of that matrix that they were covering, those gray sections with the specific questions of what to do next were unique. Um, and, and so that part provided some, you know, some value, even though it felt like I was uh, rehashing a lot of information in the subsequent chapters of part two, um, those questions did become very useful. Yeah. Well, and, and to John's part and to the book, one of the premises is, is that there's so much stuff out there today that is it's natural for us to not trust. Yeah. You can't trust the news. You can't trust websites. Oh, my God, do I know that one? And there, there's just so many things that come across that that you you hear it like John was saying. Is you start telling the story and you hope to God that the person listening is going to trust you because you know they're going to do what they can to verify what you're telling them is that it has some truth to it. Mm -hmm. And and at, at the end of the day, it, it's the, uh, I don't know what the media calls it when you have all this clutter behind you that keeps coming at you from different sources and not all of it's true. It, it's, um, I'm starting, I can't remember what the issue was, but I looked at, uh, CNN on an issue, and then I looked at the Wall Street on an issue, and I'm going, that's really interesting. They're yeah. polar opposites. Which yeah. one do you want to believe? Yeah. We've had yeah, that so no, yeah. issue with my mom, and she's a good sport, so I could pick on her, but uh, you know, where she's had her doctor say a word in passing, and she's kind of latched onto that word and looked it up and kind of gotten really um a lot of anxiety that was completely unnecessary because of some word that her doctor said in passing. And then she goes and looks it up and goes down a rabbit hole that she didn't need to go down, you know? And uh, so sometimes the evidence can be totally convincing the absolute wrong way. John, you had a neighbor of ours that uh, went, um, you know, kind of coaching him through a few rabbit holes. Um, do you remember that? That was, uh, I don't remember his name, but anyway, we won't say it anyway. But yeah, I mean, there, I guess we all have those, you know, people in our lives that will take evidence uh, the completely wrong way and uh, go off the deep end in some medical or some real estate or some investing or some Bitcoin or some thing that is completely inappropriate for them just because they found a piece of evidence that uh, they thought was relevant that really wasn't. Well, and sometimes the evidence is negative. It's not really what you want out there, but you put it out there anyways. Yeah. You know, you're, I don't know, you're planning a trip and you cancel that trip, you know, a group trip. You cancel that trip at the last minute. You do that more than once and nobody wants to work with you anymore because you're just going to cancel. Mm -hmm. you know, so why should I sign up to go on this trip with you or whatever? I just had that happen last weekend. Mm. Yeah, I know a lot of our charter clients are just going bananas with, with groups or people that will charter flights with all these big dramatic plans and, you know, they'll work with them and work with them. And then they completely change the plan because aunt Martha decided something different, you know, or whatever. And that's just kind of part of the VIP market. Um, is putting up with that sort of thing. But uh, on the other hand, it, it is evidence that you go the extra mile for your customers. And, you know, sometimes that's the, that's the nature of the business. We also develop filters. You know, what happens is yeah. you get a phone call for an airplane mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they're asking really weird questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're thinking to yourself, we don't provide this information. One of them was that that uh, the client uh, calling up for a Challenger 604 and one of the last three years um, accounting for the airplane. I've never had anybody ask for somebody else's accounting. 
Never. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, one of two things. Number one, you either don't know or you can't afford the airplane. Yeah. And if you don't know, there's a lot of sources out there for that level of information. So, of course, my focus is experience. Mm -hmm. It could be the last person they worked with. I might use that one. Well, but, and that's true because if somebody says it'll pay for itself, there's some aircraft owners on this presentation with us that can prove to you that doesn't really happen. (laughs) The, um, The uh, and so and and I haven't thought about that because I that would have been a positive take and I should have had at least one instead of two negatives. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that that's a good point. Um, (laughs) I got an inquiry from a a person who wanted to buy a corporate jet by the inquiry, and of all the silly things, it has his name, a year. And at gmail.com. Yeah, everybody's got a Gmail account. I get that. And and I get some legitimate ones that people don't want to give up their company name the first go around. Yeah. But when it's got your name in in the year, uh, I'm not re- remember this because it 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 pointed to the fact that he he was 18 years old. So Whoa. whatever 18 years ago was. Yeah. So I said, <laughs> I said, interesting email address. What happened in 2005 or whatever it was? And he goes, oh, uh, uh, that's when I signed up for my email. Okay, fine. Okay, I get it. Yeah, but you know, something that takes an exception. Again, that person is putting an image out to the marketplace that I'm this old. Yeah. When you, when you put a four-digit year in your, your email address. So it's the, the filters go right up. And the filters work both ways. When oh, people yeah. ask the right right questions i might not let you off the phone yeah until you send me a check right you know, so it's, yeah yeah exactly so and, and and the book started off on that that there's so much stuff in the atmosphere today that that we filter it our clients filter it their kids filter it yeah you know so that's it's just how it's going to work and and to my point and, and to to michael's point on this is that that the one section that I saw in there was competence, and I kind of kid a bit that I'm at 97.6% because in the last 15 years, out of 76 transactions, I have now lost two. So wow. I know. Well, I was kind of sad. It was just recent. And I was kind of giving myself a bad time. And then I did the math and said, huh, let's see next year you'll do it better. That's still a pretty freaking good record. <laughs> well, it <laughs> is. Your line of and, business. And, and I'm actually going to find a way to probably put something like that on the website. That's something. a good idea. Yeah. You know, number one is if somebody tells you they're perfect, that's a filter. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's, John might be, but I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say one of those was one of the, one of those wild goose chases that we sent you on, probably. Oh that, no, we never got that far. I, that taxi I, thing, I, or is that? I have no. I have no problem giving a person a couple of hours. Cool. You know that that's just going to happen. You cool. know, it, it's so. Um, but once we get past that, and I can't come to a determination that we're going to go forwards, and then I believe we're going to go backwards. Yeah, understood. Yeah, yeah. And you know, a lot of this is deciding when uh, to give people the benefit of the doubt and when not to. And you know, I know we've kind of turned this whole conversation from how do we prove it to customers to how to prove customers prove it to us. Uh, and that is part of the part of the conversation too. Yeah, and 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 actually, I guess back on the other part is is that so if, if I need to prove competence, which mm-hmm. you know, I, it, it's more of telling a story than it is of proof. But I don't remember seeing that there is a little gray box at the end of that one. Huh. Yeah. Maybe I will have to do the math again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think the most valuable page in this whole entire book is page 36. And that's the one that has this uh, um, outline on it or the graph. I guess it's not a, what is that called? Uh, It looks like an org chart kind of a thing. Three types of proof. Okay. Say your page page number again. Uh, 36. Yeah, you paginate differently. Yeah, it's a Kindle version. It's the first page of chapter four, the five claim types. Wait. Okay. 
All my fingers. Digital version is actually the second. Is it? First page okay. of oh, 29. Yeah, of um, chapter four? Yeah, that's 29. Okay, I'm sorry. That's it, okay. Different oh, version. Yeah, I saw that. I usually First. use the uh, paper version, so I'm a well, little bit. I mean, you could say page one of chapter four, and yeah. everybody would get to the right point because it's different pages. Right, exactly. Where, you know, the three different families of proof are corroboration, demonstration, education, and then they have examples of each of those under corroboration. They have experts and witnesses under demonstration. They have stories and documentation. And under right. education, they have information and coaching. So to John's point, corroboration was the only thing that you would accept uh, in that class. You know, you want humans, experts, witnesses, people to tell you what they know. Uh, and I think that's probably true of a lot of people. Is that true? Well, and they did that in every section because it it's uh, that's I, I remember seeing that when I got to the um, competence. Mm -hmm. I should have been to pick the We're corner. Online My wife wanted me back. You're corners. talking about online. Yeah. And if you if you, you have to be consistent throughout your message if you're selling. And mm -hmm. that includes your emails, not dot gmail dot com. <laughs> right. yeah. your company name dot com or dot org or dot something. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's yeah. on our fundamentals checklist is do you have a branded email address? Uh, you know, that's in the first week of working with anybody. Uh, if they don't, that's one of the first things we get them to do, no matter how difficult that might be, given their email provider and other crazy um hurdles they have to jump through to get that to work whichever way you want to look at it whether you're proving it to the customer or the other direction both of you need to have that in business to business and oh yeah. yeah and good point i, I respond with my great circle aircraft address and like i tell people next time i'm going to pick a shorter name just for them mm -hmm. it's, uh -huh. before yeah. we <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah that's for sure. But yeah, I really like that diagram because it really breaks down. These are the types of proof you have to have and you have to have all of them um, to be super effective. And, you know, when you're new in a business, you're not going to have all of them, but at least it gives you a map of here's what we need to build over the first six months or year of uh, building content. So it can't all be experts. It can't all be documentation. It can't all be any one of these types. Uh, you have to spread it around because different people are convinced by different things. John is only convinced by corroboration. <laughs> other people are more easily swayed by other things. Well, that's why testimonials become gold. Oh, yeah. For marketing purposes, because it's not you saying, I am so great, I'm wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got someone else saying that, you know, ABCI was great to work with the, you know, they helped me do this. They did this, whatever it is, um, you know, because those become the gold pieces of your marketing. Right. And um, what Stella is doing with us now is she's interviewing happy customers for our clients. You know, if you have a happy customer, Stella does a, an amazing interview process to uh, get the case study or the story out of them without it being awkward for anybody, you know, about uh, this is what this company did for us and it makes both parties look good, uh, which is really cool. So that's, uh, that is, yeah. checks a couple of those boxes. Yeah. Yeah, and just tell this point, you know, starting that description with the word I on multiple sentences just doesn't work. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. my mom says so. Yeah. My mom says so, right? But she passed away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's why in most copywriting, they say don't use I, 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 or don't even use we. Right. It's mm -hmm. better to put it to the you form. Mm -hmm. So, what are you going to get out of this, or what benefits will you experience um, by? working with us by purchasing this, whatever it might be. Right. And I think the third person, you know, these people did this, you know, uh, when uh -huh. we talk about 
and a, a case study of we worked with this company and they got X result uh, in the aviation industry since everybody knows everybody. Uh, that is absolute gold because they go, well, we have some similarities to that company and we want to be like them. So let's let's go do this. And stories are so much better than statistics. I mean, so much more convincing. And uh, there was another book we were reading a couple of months ago that talked about the um, logical fallacies that happen in people's heads. So if you talk about 8 million people dying in an earthquake somewhere else in the world, it doesn't have the impact as a single story of one little kid who lost a family member in an earthquake. You know, the uh, overall impact may be much smaller in the case of the story, but it has a much bigger emotional impact on a human being. And they're more likely to make decisions based on emotional impact. So statistics, eh, you know, <laughs> they're nice. But no, uh, it's, it's, it, it's worse than that because this goes back to what John was talking about. Yeah. So yeah. if they start talking about a volcano erupted and 20,000 people passed away, my first answer is how do you know it wasn't 19,182? Mm hmm. You know, because they throw out these big numbers and and it could be because I'm getting more mature in my years. Boy, that was fine. Uh, but when, when people throw out big numbers like that, I, I just throw up the red flag that says you absolutely have no idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, Seattle Times was running an uh, uh, update on the Columbia River and return of salmon. And. And at times, they wrote that in 1855, they claimed there's 10 million salmon that went up that river every year. How did they Who know? in 1855 could count to 10 million? <laughs> and how did they count them? Lewis and Clark was there 50 years before. I mean, we weren't even there. Yeah. Really, yet. And, and somehow or another, somebody knows there's 10 million salmon going up the Columbia River. See, and, and to me, that's that's where I throw in, you know, back, back to... We have to have our filters because if you don't, you're just going to be gullible. Oh, yeah. And our customers are not gullible. <laughs> They're the other. No. Well, when I tell them it's going to cost them 10 million bucks, they do get that part. But that's another story. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. every single okay. client we've ever had has said, this is enough yeah. proof. You know, and I keep saying, no, it's not. You need to prove it in a different way. You know, we need to take the same information and present it in a different way. And we need to keep going until it's overwhelming because, uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry, Michael. I... So, so Gene, when you tell your customers it's 10 million bucks, is it really 10 million bucks? Or is it 10 million, 100,000, 16 and, and 35 cents? Oh, no, we start there and go downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> if they're asking 10 million for it, we know how much we're going to offer and do the, do the puzzle backwards, if you will. No, but my, my comment is simply that I understand, you know, the, the 10 million salmon in the Columbia River, um, and, and we do need to, um, I'll call a sanity check, the numbers that we see. Yes. At the same time, That's when people cool. ask where I live, I don't tell them where I live. I tell them Salt Lake City. I don't live in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. Okay. But nobody knows where I live. So... If I tell them Riverton, they're like, where's, where's that? that? That's right. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. I'm in Salt Lake Riverton, City. Riverton, Wyoming? No, mm. Riverton, uh, Utah. Oh, darn it. Well, I was going to come on and go fly fishing. Okay. Well, we, we, can, we can do that, too. We can go to Riverton, Wyoming and do some fly fishing. That sounds fun. Um, no, so I think but, a lot of these are, are uh, round numbers to get people in the ballpark. And you're right. You know, 10 million they have no idea if it was 10 million or whether it was 8 million, but they probably have some, some estimation based on a sample size. And then they're saying, well, that puts us at this. Um, and if they don't, they're just saying it's 10 million. Well then, yeah, we need to be skeptical, but um, you know, I take a different approach and if somebody says 10 million, it's like, I had this engineering class or physics, it was physics. My, my physics class in college, and I was I was so unhappy with the professor because he was always doing, you know, give us to X number of, you know, significant digits. Mm -hmm. Well, come on. Just, you know, I just mm -hmm. want the third significant digit and put this in your thing. Well, come on. Give me a break. You know, 10 million. Well, you know, 
that's, you know, 10 million is too broad. So it has only, you know, this number of significant digits. And it's like, oh, come on. And, and I think that's part of it too, is if somebody give, if somebody gives me an exact number, 10 million, 183 and 62 cents, I'm like, there's no way you've got that down to the penny. <laughs> well, we do get there on closing, actually. Well, of course. Yeah. But, but, you know, you've got four balance. pages telling them why. There's yeah. that balance between specificity and estimation, and we need to use them at different times and in the right ways. Yeah. Because on the one hand, you don't, it's like, there's no way there were 10 million salmon. And on, you know, exactly. And mm-hmm. on the other hand, it's like, really, you know, the penny on every vehicle in this inventory. Now, sure, can you go out and find it? But yeah, it's a $10 million purchase. Do you want to get down to the nitty gritty or not? Right. Oh, okay. Now I'm in the ballpark. Yeah. So I think we need to balance. And, well, so, in, okay. and, and to your point, I, I'm, I'm going to take something that you just used as an example and run it backwards is that you tell people you're from Salt Lake City. I no longer tell people I'm from Seattle. It's just too weird. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so do you say Kirkland or what do you say, Gene? Kirkland. Yeah. Kirkland? Okay. That's that's yeah, but, it, but see well, that one works so say, well. People like, know where that real, is though. Yeah, I mean and I got real lucky on that one because if you ever go to Costco, you see the name. And that's yeah. where Cameron is where the first is famous, right? Riverton yeah. is not. <laughs> yeah, well. If they use their current headquarters, Issaquah, you look at that word and go, how do you say it? <laughs> how do you even spell it? You know, uh-huh. There's That's a really true. interesting workshop I did once on the psychology of numbers uh, and, you know, with regard to pricing. And to your point, actually, to both of your points, uh, number one, they wanted to have a not even number. And they did some studies that said if you have a not even number as a price, you are a lot less likely to get people negotiating with you because if you have a round number, people assume that it's a ballpark and that they can come, you know, you can, you'll come down 50 bucks or you'll come down this or you'll come down that. So if you have a specific number, you're a lot less likely to get involved in a um, haggling uh, negotiation and stuff like that. And the other side of it is that if you have a non-specific number, then it sounds like there's some thought that went into that number. So, you know, like one of our service levels is $2,779. It could just as easily be 3000 bucks. But we did $2,779 because of that uh, reason. And actually, we have sold a lot more since changing that price uh, of that service level. Is that because we changed the price? Of course, we'll never know, you know, that the, the um, it's not a statistically significant sample um, in John's Uh, That's interesting because in in Gene's example of the salmon, Mm -hmm. back when they were supposedly had the 10 million dot number, they weren't smart enough. Well, they may have been smart enough, but they didn't have the ability to count how many salmon were going by a certain point in a certain amount of time just by looking at it by eyeballs. Come on, Mm -hmm. really? Because they'd have to have a sample size. If they could get a valid sample size, obviously, statistically, they could tell you 10 million or whatever. Yeah, uh, like, I don't know, ice cores or some crazy thing that had sam- salmon poop. Well, I, yeah, I have I mean, no idea. There, there, there are stories of depredation of the of the count on the fish. And, and yeah. we all get that. Do I need the ridiculous numbers? Right. Do I need the number that says, if I can't trust this in this article, what can I trust? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And, and and that that that's the other end of it is in you know talking about proven and, and trust and whatnot. Yeah, overkill that, of evidence, right? And, and to Michael's point, and Michael, I one of these days I'm going to advertise an airplane with 16 cents on it, and you're going to know it's your fault. The um, <laughs> 15 cents, I'll buy it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, and because we don't see it, I mean, to the point that we'll see weird stuff. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a Hawker uh, 900 out there right now that's $4,977,000. I'm sorry, $4,977,000. It's interesting. But that is interesting. I, I'm going to suggest they put 16 cents on the end, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> you know? I wonder so, if they're using like some category of the listing service that they're using to try and keep it under $5 million. 
Well, it's that time of year that we're seeing more and more airplanes with prices on their advertisements because sales are way down this year. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, uh, there's not much hope that the fourth quarter is going to be gleaming at all. Right. If they haven't started a transaction, they're not going to get it finished. No, no. And, and, and because you send this kind of stuff around, uh, I guess you can't see it, but it came in my package. Oh, I'm yeah. glad you like that. I know, but it says Things I have to do in September. To work. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. No, but in, in to your point, so I looked it up. I said, well, there's 62 working days in this year. And you said 40. And I think, but that's about right. If you don't have it done in the next 40, it's not going to get, it's not going to happen. So yeah. it is, yeah. yeah. Actually, so, it should have been no surprise based on what happened the previous two years. You knew it had it was going the other way, and it had to come back. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I know we're off topic, but the, the the rest of the story is is we suspected those that jumped in in the last two years would start disposing by now, and that's not happening. Really, really? No. What what's what's happening is um, people aren't buying. We're down. Through the first six months, uh, seven months of this year, we were at about 1,200, but down 33%. So that means there were 600 airplanes that weren't sold. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a significant number. The market's not up by that 600. Uh, so that means there's some pull and push in there. But um, it's, it's real interesting. And I'm pretty convinced that we'll be back to 8% of the market before the end of the year available for sale, which is over the last three decades has been industry normal. Okay. Wow. Well, that's great information and completely off topic, but absolutely fabulous and invaluable to anybody listening. So, Well, and, and as you know, I put out my monthly updates and I try not to yeah. use the word I. Stella, you're good there. Mm-hmm. The, um, uh, but it, it's hard to be positive when this is the kind of information that's between the ears, mm. you know, and just putting that positive spin on it as to how this is going to benefit me or you. Well, I use a Gene Clow quote all the time, and that is that it is never a bad market for everybody at the same time. That, a market and that's for one way person true. is a good market for somebody. So that's, yep. Yep. Cool. Well, should we run around any famous last words and maybe rate it one to 10? Um, I would give it an eight. I think um, I rate the first half a 10 and the book as a whole an eight, but I think it's definitely worth a read. You know, you did an interesting thing here because as I was finishing this up last night, so I'd be somewhat conversant today. <laughs> Good for you. I, I was thinking about the, the books that I've received in the last, oh my gosh, it's been a lot of years, but yeah. um yeah. Uh, this one is probably up around a six or seven. Um, I, I still have my favorite book of all time, and that was the uh, 80 20 rule. Oh, yeah, that yeah. was um, geez, what was his name? Um, Perry Marshall, yeah, it, it, it's uh, right there somewhere, yeah, the Pareto principle. But Perry Marshall does a really, really good book on that. Maybe we should do that one again. That's been like a Bunch of years. Well, I actually, I actually thought about that because I think I probably run about 60 40 instead of 80 20, but <laughs> because I'm too lazy to do that other part of the 80%. There you go. But great book, especially about yeah. the way he applies it to marketing. But but, but to your point, I, I do a six on this one. Oh, first of all, hmm. it's not 400 pages. Thank you. You know, it's, um, it's, it's, yeah. it, you know, it's a manageable 100 and some pages. And, and that made it doable. Yeah. I know. We send big books all the time. John gets mad at me for that because they, they're they hard to get in the envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> and and maybe if they're a big book, we could do a part one and a part two. Yeah, but well, you know, yeah, put part but, one in an envelope. You, you know, true. You know, but then you add some one book every room. two months. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah, but, but quite interesting. Like one of my favorite books is 80-20, and that's probably a 300-page book. So yes, that one's fairly short as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I will. I will uh, agree with Gene. It was nice to have something short. Um, made it much easier to get through with all the other things going on. Um, one of my favorite quotes from the book is in the hard copy um, on page eighty nine. It's right at the end of chapter seven in that in the in the gray box. Okay. Oh, it says, you know. Um, how can you change the positioning of all about us 
content away from what you do and toward why you do it, how you do it, and who you do it for. Mm. And I think that is, is a great recommendation. And, um, you know, I will make that change. So um, overall, uh, using, I guess, the Amazon five stars, um, okay. I would give it a three. It just didn't really connect for me. I think that there, I think the, there's some five star content. Um, but in terms of getting through it, it just was hard for me to get through. So, you know, I think it's worth reading. Um, but, you know, I'll put it right in the middle of the road. Okay. Fair enough. Bella? Uh, I would agree with Michael and Jean. I'm kind of in the middle there, uh, probably about a, a six. Okay. Um, six out of ten. Know, Three stars or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Three stars okay. or a six or, you know, whatever ranking we're going to give it there. Somewhere right there in the middle. Okay. Um, you know, as we said, the first, I don't know, 40 pages were really good and really kind of kept you engaged. And you're like, yeah, this is good. This is, you know, something that makes sense. And then we get into the redundancy and, the, you know, the parts where you get lost. And it's like. I don't want to keep reading this. Come on, move on. <laughs> yeah, I have to read so, yeah probably somewhere in the middle. The first, I don't know, 35, 40% of the book was really good. The rest of it was mediocre. Okay. That's fair. John? No. Well, I'd probably go with the middle of the road because they didn't really address some of the things I thought they should have in enough depth to make it worthy, such as trust and how you obtain it. Mm, okay. The whole mechanics of trust. Yeah. Okay. Because they addressed so, what so we'll they let John write his own book. They didn't go in depth then. <laughs> Sorry, what stuff? I said, we'll let John write his own book on how to gain trust. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, I'm not sure how you would add the mechanics of trust in terms of marketing content, but I would love to read a book about that. If anybody has ever seen one, let's throw well, it. Michael on. and I have a suggestion. Okay. Don't make it 300 pages. <laughs> Big. Yeah. A hundred pages. That would be really cool. And it would be really easy to get into an envelope. <laughs> well, and the book we read last month was, you know, Hey, we wrote this whole book in a first draft. And in some cases, it really felt like it. It so, really showed. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. Cool. Well, we're finalizing our book list for next year. And I'd love to have any suggestions or anything else. I'm going to throw out the um, draft soon uh, on uh, Circle and uh, so on so that you guys can chime in and let me know if there are any stinkers on there or anything that is really good. So have that but thank you for joining us and let's just go around the room and do um introductions and again and pitches and whatever you are up to at the moment and how people can get hold of you so paul williams abci we help aviation companies sell more of their products and services and create content that helps you prove it whatever it is i'm john williams and i help her do that okay she's the rock star and I'm Michael Duke with DBT Aero. You can visit us online at dbt.aero. We're making 100% sustainable flight, um, both affordable and quiet. And so we look to transform the world of aviation and get them into the hands of lots of, uh, lots of aviators uh, and businesses in the future. Hopefully coming soon to an airport near Stella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm Gene Clow. I have Great Circle Aircraft, and I'm an aircraft broker of uh, Comfort Jets. And knows everything about every make and model that I've ever heard of. <laughs> it's all it's that like stuff between years aircraft. again. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Stella Bolden, copywriter with uh, ABCI, but I also do uh, Essential Oil Detective.com, is an essential oil website, and I am the travel agency at I Can Travel So Well. No, we should have uh, been talking to Stella before we uh, planned the trip, John, but uh, we actually did 
really, really well just by kind of accidentally happening into everything we happened into, which turned out great. So, but we'll talk about that in future episodes. All right. Well, we've got group office hours coming in 10 minutes. Um, you want to take a real quick break and then we will reconvene if you want to jump in for um, group office hours. If not, then thank you so much for, for being here. I think I love these conversations because it really helps us uh, uh, refine some ideas and, you know, get some, some thoughts out there on things that we wouldn't otherwise think about if somebody didn't put it in a book. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank